<clears throat> Hi, everyone. Welcome back from our brief lunch. I want to welcome you to the Open Pedagogy and Open Assign Assignments panel of OpenCon Ohio 2023. My name is Heather Capret. I work at Cleveland State University in the Center for E-Learning, and I'll be your moderator for this session. Um, Marsha Miles is also here from the Michael Schwartz Library, and she'll be helping out with the session checking chat. Uh, we'll ask that attendees mute their microphones while we get started, and then I'll prompt our audience when it's time for questions. I'd like to introduce our educators who will be talking with you today about their projects. We have Dr. Wang Yu, our Open Educational Resources Librarian from Clemson University, and he'll be presenting with Leah Holcomb, who's a doctoral student and instructor at Clemson. Uh, next, we'll have a group of instructors from Cleveland State University, Dr. Kathy Kernow, who's a professor in art and design, Dr. Vanya De Paoli, who's a senior lecturer in chemistry, Dr. Shelley Rose, professor in history, and Dr. Melanie Gagic, who's a senior lecturer in English. Um, so what I'll do is ask all pr our presenters to explain their open pedagogy and open assignment creation projects in about four minutes each. And then we'll look to see if there's any questions from the audience in the chat. So go ahead and please post questions in the chat for our presenters. Um, we do have a set of questions that we can ask, but we'd like to see what the audience is interested in. And so if any uh, presenters need to share their screens, just let us know and we can promote you to co-host. So I'll stop my share at this time. And we'll start with Dr. Yong Wu and Leah Holcomb, please. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you. Uh, sorry, uh, I'm getting uh, unstable internet connections. Uh, if it's okay, I'll just not uh, show my video uh, for, for the moment. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm the Open Resources Librarian from Clemson University in South Carolina. Uh, since uh, 2019, I have worked with campus partners, um, as well as interested faculty and uh, also uh, uh, graduate students to develop a open uh, textbook creation uh, program as a part of uh, open uh, that's written by students as a part of open pedagogy um, at Clemson University. Um, and I'll let uh, Leah, um, who is one of the participants of this program, introduce herself as well. Thank you, Dr. Wu. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Leah Holcomb. I'm a doctoral candidate at Clemson. Um, I mostly focus my research in public health, and I genuinely enjoy teaching pre-health and public health undergraduates. Um, so the this class kind of, you know, using Dr. Wu's approach has been something that's kind of been integrated in the health uh, education program at Clemson, in the health science program. And it's been done three or four times, I think now. And this is my first time doing it, but really our focus was just to allow students to be able to write this text and, um, have something to show at the end of the semester. I think that's very rewarding for undergraduates to complete projects and get to do them. Um, and so that's really what we focused on was um, allowing each student to develop a chapter that related to their interests um, specific to the class topic and my expertise is in substance use. And so that's what we wrote about. Um, and the whole goal was to make a very readable text that's um, particularly students in high school and young adults could read and understand and learn from. So yeah, thank you. I believe Kathy's next, if Kathy wants to go ahead. Hi, I'm Kathy Curnow from Cleveland State and I teach African art history as well as some other topics. I've done an open con enormous textbook before <laughs> having to do with African art history, but this is about a different project. So I'm going to share my screen if I can find the right. Uh, yeah. If Barb's on, can you promote Kathy Cornell to a co-host? I'm not able to do it with my permissions. Yep. Kathy, your co-host now. Okay, thank you. Um, but that's not my, it's not, it's not actually showing what I have open that I want to share. 
Oh dear. Um, Kathy, do you see like a share oh, there we button go. There we at go. the top? No, it wasn't the share button. It was the actual screen that wasn't going up for some reason. But here it is. Uh, this is a project called Bright Insight that I started back in 2017 with a, a seminar that uh, dealt with African cities. And each student had an assignment to, oh, I forget how many, create three or five entries for a prospective website. And the website has been live since then. I've used it with other classes since then. And I have a huge backlog. <laughs> so what you see is the screen that I hope before you now, can, can you all see it? Okay. Yeah. And it moves around, it's the entire continent. And so wherever you see either a red marker or markers with numbers, you can click on it to expand it, and it will take you to various entries. So for instance, uh, this one, you can then click on it to open. And this is a student paper about a particular public sculpture in the town of Ife in Nigeria. And the thing about this project is many of these topics that my students chose are not things that anybody else has really written about. So they have to do a lot of original research in sometimes some odd places. And sometimes it will take them down internet holes that I wouldn't normally have sent them to. But I was really pleased with her. Uh, she did as much research as she could. She found other images that helped to explain the sculpture. Uh, there is built into the program a map that shows where in the town it is, and there are certain keywords, and uh, normally there is a bibliography, but I think she didn't have much in the way of bibliographies in this particular instance. You can access this through keywords and other ways, and this covers not only the entire continent, but the entire continent throughout history which means that we are, each one uh, jumps to a different kind of building and is a very different kind of story. So this, for instance, is a Johannesburg neighborhood that was promoted as a gentrified center city space. And the student did a lot of research and has many images. And each of these images has further captions and so forth. And there is a, a very, extensive bibliography on this example. So it, it includes, I just showed you two things that are modern, but we actually have quite a lot of historical buildings, palaces and so forth. But it will, uh, the effort is to show all aspects of the continent from religious buildings, palaces, hospitals, hotels, archeological sites, et cetera, to give a better, fuller picture of urban Africa throughout the ages. And there really is no single source for this. And uh, it is expanding so that other professors and their students can also be involved in it. And we are hoping in future, because I'm going to be on sabbatical, maybe to get a grant uh, that would extend our reach into Africa so that uh, African professors of uh, urban studies, landscape architecture, architecture, public spaces and so forth could involve their students because the site has the capacity to have directly recorded interviews and videos as well as images and text. Thank you, Kathy. Um, Vanya, would you like to go next, please? Sure, thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Vanya De Paoli. Um, I am a senior lecturer faculty in chemistry um, and uh, I have been working at Cleveland State uh, for quite a while right now. Um, this will be, I will start my 10th year um, in this next fall. So over the past um, two years, I have been the sole faculty teaching organic chemistry um, for the department and uh, I oversee students through the whole college. So um, every semester I have a large amount of students coming to both my lecture and uh, laboratory courses. And uh, 
Uh, my project has been, I'm relatively new uh, to open education resources, uh, but uh, my project started um, around 2000, 2021. So right in the interface between the COVID pandemic and returning to fully um, to teach on campus um, in the fall. And uh, I think my, my, dri my driving force was um, several. The number one is, um, my, at the time I had a coworker and uh, we were in process of switching course materials and um, it was my opportunity to introduce uh, very new, very new uh, information as materials to the courses without, um, without a lot of headaches and in the bureaucracy in the process. And um, um, at the time, I was quite frustrated with the prices of, um, you know, course materials. We have textbooks that are very expensive and other resources that were quite expensive, expensive for our students. So um, I reached out to the library and uh, I have been participating in to open books and open evaluation of open resources. I try to use some of those resources for my courses. And my whole goal was um, gradually transfer from uh, paid publishers to um, open resources, open textbooks, uh, open assignments. And so in the fall 2021, I came with a bunch of different uh, resources that I would like to share with my students and see how it goes, how that helps. Um, so to say uh, very, a short, a long story, very short, uh, it was quite frustrating um, in part because um, I could not immediately let it go of the paid resources. I would try to grade, uh, gradually to remove that. And uh, I, my students, they, they pay for the resources, they use the resources. If they have to use the resources, otherwise they were not touching the resources. And of course, I've always felt that this affects the outcome of the courses. So one of the components of these courses is what we call adaptive resources, which are assignments that uh, seems to identify what the students struggle the most and are proposing um, automatically some sort of um, assignments uh, extra questions to try to fix uh, that learning gap that the students present when they're solving problems. Um, and that is, is, is pretty common right now. Um, you know, I can see that with my young children in elementary school, they have a lot of that with math. Um, they have that in pretty much all the levels. But uh, when it came to my courses, I didn't feel that this was helping a lot, in part because um, I felt the students becoming very frustrated uh, with the results and the time extensions for their assignments. And second, because, uh, well, once they felt that it was becoming too long, most of them took the shortcut and decided to either ask for the answers from someone else or, you know, starting to post their questions on Shaggy or other online resources that would help them to get the answers, but not necessarily the knowledge. So um, I tried those for those resources, open resources as, um, hey, here it is. And, um, you know, see how do you like that? See, let me know if that is helping um, for about one year. And I see very little results. So last uh, spring, spring of 2022, I proposed uh, a grant, a small grant from um, our library, the Michael Schwartz Library at Cleveland State, where I identify for the students what I felt it was sources of uh, struggle. And um, I propose the assignments where they would be capable of tackle those those main challenging topics um, as many times as they want um, for points. So they would have that, you know, extra incentive of doing the assignments, but uh, um, they could do as many times as they want. And I always keep the highest score um, for the assignments. And um, so this is my project is in fact, I like talking. Um, you probably guys, many of you probably saw that uh, on Discord, this posted on Discord. And uh, I in fact am seeing 
that those students that are really dedicating uh, to work on those assignments, that they, they see that as an opportunity to close the learning gaps, they are benefiting of that more than uh, any other assignment that I have been providing, such as the homeworks. I, and uh, in, in my opinion, those assignments, they have been um, a much better uh, way of predicted final course outcomes than homework or any other practices that the students are doing. Thank you, Vanya. Um, Shelley, you're next. Thank you. Awesome. Hi, thanks everybody. Can you hear me okay? Okay, just making sure my my sound is working finally. Um, I'm Shelley Rose. I'm Associate Professor of History and Women's and Gender Studies at Cleveland State University. Um, I'm also co-founder of the Cleveland Teaching Collaborative, where we have a lot of fun thinking about teaching, and a lot of my open pedagogy has really transformed um, in the past three years, talking with a lot of our colleagues across Northeast Ohio. Um, but one of the things that I like to do is have open educational resources that I post on Pressbooks um, with the help of our amazing library staff and e-learning staff at CSU. Um, and part of this comes from my experience as a digital humanist. I sort of had this philosophy that if we're going to do history, um, if we're going to do scholarship, it should be in public, right? We should make those findings and those arguments and all of these cool resources, get them out of the archives and into people's, you know, meet people where they are on their phones and their tablets, you know, whatever it takes. Um, and so at CSU, I also teach um, pre-service social studies teachers. And so ever since I started now in 2011, so quite a while ago, um, I've sort of had this philosophy of transparent teaching is what I used to tell my students. Everything I do, I'll tell you why. Um, now this is basically open pedagogy, right? This kind of theory that we all have open materials. Um, and so what I've been doing in, since like 2014 with the help of an affordability grant for textbooks from the CSU Michael Schwartz Library. Um, my first press book was actually a geography press book um, to help my geography students. The textbooks were cost prohibitive more so than some of our history textbooks. And so I created an open educational resource for that. And I feel like, so I used to do Greyhound Rescue and they used to say, you can't have just one Greyhound, they're like potato chips, you have to keep going. I feel like that's the way open pedagogy is. Um, whenever I adopt something new, I think, oh, where else can I use this? I'll do this again and again and again. Um, so I think it was, must have been last spring, Heather Capret actually talked to me about H5P. And so I wanted to present to you my H5P projects that students did in 200 level classes this past fall. Um, they did them in my geography class and in our 200 level historical studies, intro to historical studies class. And actually, if I can share my screen, I'll just show an example real quick, um, just to show you what H5P can do. Do you see the share button? I, I, I can't. Okay, good. Thank you. Sorry, I was just making sure I shared the right screen. I have all kinds of cool stuff up from the keynote. Um, can everybody see Larry Doby's double? Okay, cool. Um, so H5P is a, basically has a library of um, what are basically HTML5 um, frames or modules. Heather can probably say this better. Um, and the students are able to take them and create pieces of um, digital publishing that are interactive. And so what my historical study students did is we went to special collections in our library and they looked up primary documents related to Cleveland, related to basically anything they were interested in studying. Um, and one of my students pulled this picture of Larry Doby in the World Series game in 1948. It's a Cleveland baseball game. Um, and what they're doing is both content and learning digital skills. They're doing historical thinking, which is um, for historians, that means looking at a source and saying, who wrote it? What is it? When was it written? These kinds of things. So sourcing, they're basically showing me their work when they look at the primary source. So they do their sourcing questions. And one of those steps of historical thinking is contextualization. And so they used H5P to contextualize the documents they found. And so this is the picture of Larry Doby getting his double. Um, and pardon me, I'm not super great at baseball. Um, so hopefully that's the way you say it. But here's Larry Doby, and they talk about his context, right, as the first Black baseball player in the Major Leagues Baseball American League, um, and how he signed on with the Cleveland Indians. He played in the World Series, that he had this famous play. 
Um, and there's actually, I wanted to point out, the student also linked um, out to a resource. So this is actually H5P letting them put hotspots in the image and contextualizing the historical moment. And so here, this one is this the field that they played at. So it talks a little bit about the Boston Braves. I thought this was creative of the student. The umpire has the stats, right, um, from the game. And so they really fleshed out the context, but in a way that, whoops, sorry, but in a way that um, helps them interact with the primary source, really show me their historical thinking, but also laying it out for a public audience so that now we have this collection in the student edited press book, and you can see it here. The assignment is called H5P in the archive. I think Heather put the link in the chat, but I can too if it's not there. And you can see all the students chose different things. Some of them chose political cartoons, um, you know, monuments and things like that. And But what was common about it is that they all created a public product um, kind of showing people and me as their instructor, their historical thinking. One thing I like about this is that then they can take something like this and put it on their resume, their link, because it's public, it's hosted by the library. You know, I don't have to pay the bills, so I know it'll be up and they know it'll be up. Um, and they can um, then include that in their resume and apply for jobs and show them that they have these skills, right? Not just the digital skills, but the content skills as well. Um, I actually run into, ran into a graduate last weekend and he said, thank you for making me do all those projects. I put them on my resume and people liked them. <laughs> Um, and so it's not just sort of this um, empty thought of mine, I guess. It actually, you know, seems to help them. So anyways, I look forward to your questions. I wanted to show you that. My geography class did a similar um, project. They used H5P, and what they did is something called concentrates of place, and they demonstrated their spatial thinking to me. Um, and that project actually they have a longer semester project and they were really having trouble with place, which is the meaning of a space um, historically in the class. And so I adopted this project where they created a little tin with um, meaningful items from their space, from a certain space that gave it meaning. Um, and they used H5P. We went to the digital design studio in the library with Ben Richards and um, took pictures of their tins. And then they used H5P to tag their tins and tell me what their, their objects were and how they related to their place. And so they're basically showing me their thinking and their digital skills at the same time. And I'm pretty sure that must be four minutes. So thank you. I look forward to talking about all this. Thank you, Shelly. Uh, Melanie, would you like to go next, please? Yes. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and try to share my screen, which is not working. Hold on. OK, there we go. Sorry. Uh, okay, so hello, uh, my name is Melanie Gagich, and I am a first year writing instructor at Cleveland State University. Um, I generally teach about four sections of first year writing per semester, um, but I find that a lot of my open pedagogy actually happens in English 102, which is the last course in the um, sequence. So that's what I'll be talking about today. Um, in terms of a researcher, uh, I earned my PhD in composition and applied linguistics, but my research interests include open pedagogy, multimodality, and digital rhetoric. Um, and just in case you're not familiar with multimodality, essentially it means using a variety of modes um, to um, share some sort of purpose. So a website, a infographic, a podcast, a TikTok video, et cetera, are all examples of multimodal texts. Um, and then also I'm an OER advocate. So I'm a co-creator with Emily Zickel, who I do believe is on the call, um, of the First Year Writing Textbook, A Guide to Rhetoric, Genre, and Success in First Year Writing. Um, so we started developing that in 2017, and then it was integrated into all First Year Writing classes at Cleveland State in 2018. So students in our First Year Writing program have a completely open access textbook, um, and they don't have to buy any other textbooks. And then I've also been an OpenCon committee member for, I think, five years. So uh, teacher, researcher, and OER advocate. Um, in terms of my open pedagogy assignments, um, I actually started doing this before I knew what open pedagogy was. Um, so one of the ones that I created first is what I call a discourse community multimodal assignment. And you can click on that link if you'd like to see the assignment sheet. Um, and essentially what I'm asking students to do is to create a digital multimodal text. So again, for example, a website, podcast, video, et cetera. And they needed to target a really specific community of which they were members. Um, and then what sort of made this a non-disposable 
disposable assignment uh, is the fact that I asked them to share this with a real audience. So they would do this in a variety of ways. They might post a link to their work on social media. They might literally give it to somebody in a poster form, um, et cetera. And then right before the pandemic, I integrated a textbook mini presentation. So using and embracing the first year writing um, open access textbook that I just talked about, um, I asked students to basically, you know, use the book, pick a chapter and create some sort of short presentation as well as an interactive um, piece of media. I was working on this in the hopes of eventually adding it to the textbook or to another iteration of the textbook, but uh, because of the pandemic that kind of went out the window. So instead, Oh, well, I'm sorry. I wanted to show you two examples of what the multimodal text would look like. So this is an example of a student who wrote about metal elitism. And then you can see that he shared it and it got 381 comments from his community and 245 likes. To date, that is still the most like interactive I've seen of my students, but I thought that was pretty cool. And then here's an image of a student um, who just created a website about podcasts. And then they um, you know, did various things to sort of share it with the community. Okay, so after the discourse community um, assignment, I also, oh dear, oh boy, sorry. <laughs> I also just created um, a new assignment, which sort of embraces what I did with the discourse community assignment, which is asking students to create another multimodal web text um, that includes at least two modes of communication that shared academic data with a popular audience. So in this current uh, reframing of my multimodal assignment, I'm asking students to really embrace the idea of being a researcher. So we begin the uh, semester by talking about what does it mean to be a researcher. Then we start by talking about openly licensed material versus copyrighted materials, talking about ideas like should information be free? Um, what are all of these sort of like Elsevier and places like that? You know, who's making the money? A lot of students think that professors are getting rich off of all of their academic articles that they publish. Um, and so we talk about how that that's not the case. Uh, and so we talk about the publishing system. Uh, Mandy Goodset often comes in and talks about this with me. Ben Richards has come in. Um, Kathy Fisher also came in this semester. So a lot of um, working with the librarians to talk about what is open pedagogy, what is open. So that sort of starts the whole uh, conversation. And then this assignment is second in the sequence. And again, you can sort of see the steps that I share with students here, asking them um, so again, find some sort of academic research that is empirical, take that data, and then figure out how you could share it with an audience uh, in a way that would make it easier to digest, but also in a way that is really ethical. So that also brings in conversations about, you know, what is misinformation, what is disinformation. We watch Dr. Oz to show like what sort of misinformation or disinformation can look like. We have them sort of evaluate, or I have them evaluate that to figure out um, how they can make their multimodal text better. Um, then I asked them to decide whether or not to create a co Creative Commons license so that they could share it openly. And then, of course, I asked them to share it with a real public, a real audience. Um, I don't require them to do the Creative Commons or to share it publicly, but I do urge them to. Um, and students get really excited about it. And just recently, at the end of the semester, students said that the coolest thing that they learned in my English 102 class was what open access was or what Creative Commons were. So I'd say about 25 out of 65 students said that that was like the thing, the coolest thing that they learned this semester. And then if you have time, you can check out this student example um, of this assignment. He created this, um, trying to make it look like a TikTok video. Um, and it's being used with permission. And it's about three minutes long. And then if you are interested, you can also click on some of these links that will take you to some of my um, assignments. But this is definitely still a, a progress or a work in progress. And I look forward to any questions you might have. Thank you. And stop share. Thank you all for sharing your projects and assignment ideas with us. So at this time, we'll look in chat for questions. If you want to raise your hand, I'll call on you and um, you could unmute your mic if you'd like. Okay, um, so I'm not seeing any questions yet from the audience come in. So what I'll just do is start in on some general questions I'd like to ask of the, the panel. What led or motivated you to explore open pedagogy? Can you describe your path into open pedagogy and what sort of support did you receive along the way when doing it? I 
guess I can answer that or I can start to answer that. Um, so um, for me, the open pedagogy was, um, I always felt that that should be the way. Um, so I, I did not have my education in the United States. Um, so in my old days in old colleges, I mean, we don't even get one textbook that, you know, this is your textbook or following this textbook. Um, we got it a list of potential books that we could use and uh, you know those volumes they were in library and uh, we were taught that whenever it's covering lecture you go and search for those books uh, in the library and uh, you know anything's fair everything's fair and uh, you don't like one book you search for another one so that has always been sort of a culture clash with me um so uh, I don't, I don't know if I ever say that anywhere, but um, I'm from Brazil, um, South America trained, um, you know, and uh, so when I came to the United States, when I started to, to teach, um, then I think that was always something that I felt very different from my own education. Um, the fact that our students, no matter how many books they have available in the libraries, uh, they stick with that one that the teacher says, no matter how expensive that is. And um, it doesn't seem that there's a lot of flexibility um, in, in get rid of that, right? So, and I think that's part of the reason why um, I, I felt that the, if I start slowly adopting uh, any open resources for my courses, the students would feel that, well, we have so much to explore, especially right now that we have internet. Um, 20 years ago when I was in college, there was no internet. So now we have internet, we have open access, we are on the information era. So everything is so accessible, you know, that would be a one way to help the students um, to, to kick it in this idea of being, proactive and search for good information, good resources. And uh, I think that uh, this is something that perhaps uh, can be taught over the years, but uh, you know, it took me and the librarians, uh, and Cleveland State librarians and Mandy, I know that Mandy's there, so her, uh, and Teresa and the many others to help me to, first of all, identify what, what was open, what could be done, what was um, good uh, resources. And uh, they were also the first ones to help me with my grant to, you know, to launch my grant uh, project. And, uh, I rely heavily on them. So, um, and I think that it works. I mean, when you have an idea, I think, it, you know, I think the whole idea of open education is more to teach our students that, you know, you don't have to be stuck into any, any material that is very expensive. Um, yeah, they're, all, they're awesome and, and, you know, they're useful, but you don't have to, there are other options out there. So I leave it for here now, so more for discussions. Thank you, Hania. Um, I don't know if anybody else wants to answer that, but we um, do have some questions coming in too. So please go ahead. Um, I guess I can answer um, a little bit about why I went to, uh, started with open pedagogy. Uh, what started me in open pedagogy is that um, my library system provides a lot of active support for faculty in switching uh, from their traditional learning materials to OER. And I interacted with a lot of faculty and their students. And to, I also developed a lot of assessments to see how well uh, students are benefiting from OER as compared to traditional uh, textbooks and other learning materials. And one thing that I found from my assessment is that students are, you know, in many ways, not very motivated to learn because of the system of traditional textbooks. So textbooks and the associated learning materials such as homework systems like uh, iClicker and other uh, classroom res response systems are pretty expensive. A lot of students can't afford them. So a lot of faculty have basically decided uh, I'm either gonna make purchasing these things optional or that I'm gonna make um, basically uh, not gonna teach very heavily from these materials or traditional textbooks. And as a result, a lot of students began to feel that learning is really messed up 
um, since they're not even required to read a textbook or learn from certain things. Um, and there's basically a tiered student learning response uh, from students who could afford the learning materials and students who can't afford the learning materials. And students just uh, overall felt that using all these paid materials was just incredibly a boring process that where they're simply, uh, you know, uh, recording, uh, t just basically entering their uh, responses into these systems and getting more grades for these. Um, I saw this could be a uh, help by switching over to uh, things such as, uh, you know, OER or free or low cost uh, learning systems uh, and homework systems, but it didn't. Um, students just felt that, you know, using these systems was just not very motivating. Um, they also questioned based on the experience they had, whether reading a traditional textbook was really necessary because instructors traditionally had not re re really required them to purchase or really read from these textbooks because they were so expensive. Um, and basically, I began to think if there's a way of increasing student motivation and also making learning interesting and fun for them. And I also uh, saw the potential in open pedagogy of creating non-disposable assignments as something that really has longer term value to the students. And that's what I got into um, why I started open pedagogy. Um, and I was I enjoyed a lot of support from both my libraries and my institution, primarily because um, the head instruction librarian at the libraries was very inter interested in this. She teaches courses as well. Also, the center, uh, the head of the Center for Teaching and Learning at my institution was very in interested in this as well. They all realized the issue was traditional textbooks and student learning motivation. And also the, uh, uh, the associate dean for the division of uh, undergraduate studies was also very interested. Um, I have to say, I started uh, at that time, there were no uh, like certificate programs or anything like that for open pedagogy. But I began to network with people such as uh, uh, the open uh, uh, who can be found on the open uh, pedagogy notebook, people who are expert op uh, open pedagogy practitioners, such as Karen Kangalosi and uh, you know Elizabeth Mays and other people, and uh, my institution also began funding um, uh, me to uh, like invite these people for invited talks, um, and also I they also encouraged me to speak at various professional development e uh, events for faculty. And that attracted a lot of faculty from different uh, departments. Um, and also they began to also encourage other faculty and their uh, even uh, graduate student instructors. Um, so that was, uh, I think, uh, what got me into ped open pedagogy. Yeah. And I felt there was a strong um, yeah, success uh, uh, in, and interest in that as well and really allowed open pedagogy to grow at my institution. Thank you, Dr. Wu. Um, I was very impressed that you guys were able to take undergraduates and make like entire open textbooks by the end of the semester or quarter. Um, so like I thought about like what online tools did you use for fear uh, for peer feedback and peer editing of the drafts, but this is kind of ties into Pam Ecker's question. Uh, how long typically does it take students to learn to use a new content creation tool and how do you support that learning? So really this applies to um, all the people that did open pedagogy projects. If you want to go ahead and start and then somebody else can jump in too. Thanks. Uh, sure. I think I can answer that first. Um, I think using a uh, uh, new technology is fairly easy um, because students are, uh, you know, people, they are quite tech savvy and they can uh, do a lot of innovative things with it. What we've done is using uh, press books. Um, and uh, we found that, you know, students, uh, sometimes they might be not very, uh, might be really, um, you know, surprised at the novelty of using something new and uh, be uh, you know caught off guard in new technology, but we found that this really works uh, if you develop uh, if you scaffold uh, learning of new technology, peer editing everything gradually into uh, a semester uh, in a course. Uh, for example, even at the start of the semester, you began to give them small assignments that where they have to work collaboratively. They have to 
peer edit each other's work, they also have to like um, gradually develop uh, like uh, their own uh, chapter in an open textbook. Um, uh, if it's this process where they continually get a lot of uh, uh, you know practice uh, and um, uh, and they go from simple to more complex. Uh, it's easy for them to learn things. Another thing I found is that you really need to develop instructional materials, um, like whether it's clear instructions um, for how to create an open textbook. Um, also, uh, you might want to create a lot of videos and other things um, for the students. If they, for example, miss a class or if they want to go back on something. Um, also, what I found is for um, you know uh, things such as uh, copyright, it's good to give students a simple practice assignment where they have to find two copyrighted uh, sorry two copyright friendly images, um, uh, and um, you know they have to explain why they relate to their assignment that they're doing, and also uh, in terms of why. Um, uh, uh, and also, they have to write attributions. They have to make sure everything gets it right. Um, students, some, uh, most students do well, but some students do uh, struggle a little bit with this. But what I've found is that it's good to make assignment, every assignment, um, like kind of, uh, uh, you don't have, it's not a one-time assignment. Um, you can, if you don't do well in the assignment, you can redo the assignment, submit it to me again. Um, and also, you know, I'll give you more feedback. Um, uh, and I found, uh, I've done this for a, a course that I taught and I've, uh, you know, provided support on how to use Pressbooks and also uh, on the copyright assignment for many other courses. Uh, and I find that this approach of letting students uh, do the assignment again if they don't do well um, and get further feedback, that really helps. Um, but in terms of uh, more uh, like uh, uh, support uh, and sort of uh, integrating open pedagogy and open textbook writing into specific courses. Uh, I'll let Leah talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, um, I think it's definitely, we, we have the luxury of all of our students are in an uh, acceptance only program. They all know each other. And so when it comes to peer feedback and things like that, it was much easier. It, I think we had 22 students in the course. So it is much easier to work when you're in a very small um, group of students, mostly juniors and seniors, so they have some some writing training already. Um, but I think, yeah, definitely breaking it up. And then we spend a lot of time in class working on it. Um, I'm not a big fan of traditional lectures. I think they're really boring. No one wants to hear me talk for an hour and 15 minutes, and I don't want to talk for that long. So a big part of that was really, you know, one, about once a week, we'd have a day it was dedicated to peer evaluation or just working on the drafts and answer questions and talk through the content. Um, and definitely having multiple iterations for submissions. I think we did three separate like dedicated peer review days. They each turned in three drafts. Um, and they, even after the final, the, the final draft, which was you know kind of their final grade in the course, you know, they were still making edits and doing things. Um, and in terms of like learning a technology, I don't think a single one of my students was born before 2000. So they're very, very good with tech. They pick things up very quickly. Um, some of them were figuring things out in press books faster than I was. So um, I, I think with this group of students, they're so used to technology, it's not as hard. They're, it, they're comfortable with that. They're used to online textbooks. They've been using that through college. Um, so I think they actually prefer this than, than using traditional textbooks. Um, and I never really had an issue motivating them. I really didn't. And that might not be translatable to all students, but I think for them, the opportunity to have a product at the end of their class, which is so very rare for undergraduates, really helped to keep them engaged throughout the whole semester. Like I never really had students. You had a few, the writing, they weren't as strong of a writer. And so it was a little bit more challenging to put their chapters together. Um, and it also helped that our health science program has already had a faculty member do this multiple times. So they had something to kind of view and see like, so other students who I know did this class. And so that really helped put it in their heads of what they were supposed to do. But yeah, um, definitely the in-class piece like this, you got to be able to communicate with them and, and sit down and read. And um, that was, that was a big part of, of keeping them engaged, things like that. But yeah. These are all great tips. I'll just 
add, I'm so sorry, like it's 2.15. Um, I can stick around until 2.30. If we want to continue with questions and answers, we can also put a channel, make sure there's a channel on Discord for this. And you could continue discussion there. Um, if you need to take a break, please do take care of yourself. Um, but we have another presenter coming up at 2.30. So I will stick around for anybody else who wants to stick around and we can continue, uh, but we'll get kicked off at 2.30. <laughs> Just wanted to warn you. Um, does anybody wanna to add to the question about students learn? Yes, yeah, Shelly, please. I just wanted to point out, I put it in the chat, but um, especially with H5P and other digital technologies I've taken on, I, I have a problem and I like to experiment with new things all the time. And so one thing that I do is after I write an assignment um, in particular with H5P, I do it with them. So I set aside class time to for them to work on the project and I scaffold it like we've been talking about. But I also, as we're talking about what that step is, I do the step with them. Um, and so... I think that's kind of important. It helps me understand their perspective and what they're encountering, especially if it's a new technology for me. Um, but also it gives them a model to keep referring back to. Thank you. Does anybody wanna to add to that? Um, I would like to add just one thing. Um, so I've done quite a few presentations about multimodality um, over the years and one of the biggest questions I always get from folks is, well, how do you learn all of that technology? <laughs> and my answer every time is I don't. Um, I'm actually pretty terrible with technology, to be fair. <laughs> my students are way better at it than I am. And I think we were saying this in the chat, but like I do try to approach this as a problem solving opportunity. Um, and I tell my students straight up, I'm like, I'm not going to answer that question. <laughs> like I know how to use like three programs um, well, and even that isn't isn't great. And things are changing all the time. And so I I try to model problem solving. So sort of what like Shelly was saying, um, I don't use like one program, but like I will let them see me struggling to like do stuff up on the big board um, so that they can see that literally I go to Google or I go to YouTube or I ask again, I said that I asked librarians to visit my class. Um, so I try to you know show my students that I'm asking other experts and not just um, not just sort of keeping it in my own little bubble. Yeah. So learning in public. Yeah. Um, and, you know, students like that. And I make fun of myself a bit quite a bit. And then they also will help me. And so they'll come up and help me with the, the technology and things like that. So, yes, uh, I don't think you you don't have to be a technology expert to do any of the, those things, at least in my opinion. Thank you, Melanie. Um... Kathy, do you want to add anything? Yeah. If not, okay, um, go ahead. I, I just wanted to say that I think having um, students present their work in public, whether it be like our map based website or in a textbook, I really think it adds another dimension. They work harder and they dig deeper knowing that somebody else is going to be reading it. And I know how proud um, one of my students was because I let them know I had to, you know, I, when I went up for promotion, I had to do a, a search of who had used what of my work and everything. And I had co-written something with a student and it was in somebody's, uh, a scholar's academic book in the bibliography. And that made both of us, I think, really pleased because I know there's no information on a lot of this material that's gathered together online. And if our effort is to change people's perceptions of what Africa is like, and it's a long-term project um, that's, I hope, going to go on for many years, knowing that it impacted a scholar uh, within the first couple of years really made us all feel very good. Thank you. Um, so I'll jump to the next question by, I think it's Ineskia Dillard. She asks, for students who are subject matter averse and are not interested in creating a digital identity, what do you do to support them in this and their learning? So I'm kind of, I'm thinking about students here who might also not want their name published online. Like, I'll let you guys go for it here. 
Um, I'd like to jump in on this one real quick. Sorry, I feel like I'm talking a lot, but um, I actually did my dissertation on students' emotional responses to um, sharing their work online. And there are definitely some students, you know, post-millennial students, uh, Gen Z, whatever you want to call them, who truly hated it. Um, and I asked them to do it. I did require them to do it unless they had like a accommodation from OIE or um, ODS. And just because I was doing it as part of that research and some students like fought me the whole way. So I definitely think that this is something important to consider. And after I was done with my dissertation research, I stopped making that an absolute mandatory part of it because so many students do kind of have some anxiety about posting stuff online. Um, and so they can do it and just post it to me if they would prefer now. But I also know that like our library has um, some information about um, you know, how to create your own like online presence and thinking about privacy. So I also didn't require that students posted their real name. So if they wanted to come up with a name or something like that, um, that's always been an option for them no matter what. But again, I just think it's some, it's definitely something to consider and I don't require them to do it no matter what anymore. I do require it, but I give them the option of using initials and none of them have ever taken that option. And I think part of what makes them more comfortable perhaps is I tell them in advance, this is not just for our class. And as I am the editor of this project, I'm very concerned about the final uh, appearance of it. So if you have essentially written it all and only minor edits were used, your name will be on it. If I had to do major edits, I'll put your name comma ed period. And if I had to add a lot of stuff because you didn't include it, uh, my name will be there after yours. But nobody who reads the site will know the reasoning behind those things. So they don't feel like they're gonna mess it up if they're not confident about their English or if, they're, if they miss out on something. And I don't penalize them for that because for most of them, this is a completely new topic. So, you know, I, I, I just want the final project to reflect their input correctly and uh, give them that opportunity to shine. And I've been very happy with the results. Um, another thing I wanted to add is having a consent form at the start of the term, which clearly states the students' yes. uh, rights uh, and having them sign. And uh, also having the form saying that they could withdraw their chapter, particularly this is very easy on press books if they want. It's very useful for them. Yeah, I think every year there's been maybe one ish one student who just isn't up that the, the writing of it just really isn't up to publication. So they we have a sit down chat and are like, do you want to put in the effort? And then they're like, no, we just we just delete it before publication. But we give them that option at the end and it won't hurt their grade or anything. I had one thing to add, and that is, although I've done this most successfully in seminars, I have tried it in 300 level courses, and it is problematic uh, because they are usually those are writing across the curriculum courses. They have a chance to revise all that and so forth, but they're not a subject dedicated, and because it fulfills a requirement, although they're not requirements. They look at them as inconsequential to their majors, and so they don't put as much effort in them. I'm not going to do it again. <laughs> yeah, I think from a class size too, like, I love teaching, but it's a lot of work on the faculty. I mean, you have a lot of grading and a lot of reviewing, a lot of meeting with students. So you, I wouldn't suggest more than like 20. I think we cap our classes at 25 for these just because it's, it's a lot of a lot of work. Um, it's very rewarding, but it's not, it's not like grading tests or something like that. It's a lot of reading and editing. I just wanted to point out, uh, Mandy Goodset put a good link to learning more about open pedagogy. It's openpedagogy.org. Like if you're interested in starting out and trying it from the beginning. Um, I do have another question. How do open pedagogy practices promote transferable skills and career readiness in students? If somebody would like to go for that one. 
Um, I can kind of talk from a healthcare perspective. I would say the bulk of my students are applying to medical school or um, PA school, pharmacy school, dental school. And a significant portion of that is, you know, we kind of know whether you work in healthcare or not, healthcare providers are bad at communicating. That's a pretty standard thing. They're typically highly educated. And what they learn is not about how to communicate with patients, like say a nurse does, that's a core part of their curriculum. Um, and a lot of the students, when they were saying, no, you have to write at a level that not necessarily the entire general population, but maybe a high school student, someone with a high school education can read at, that was very challenging for them. Um, so they really had to rethink about the language that they're using, the words that they're using. Um, and then, you know, my course itself was designed around substance use, which is a very stigmatized topic. And so they had to learn about appropriate language when you're talking about different groups and things like that. And um, those communication practices, I think, will follow them in, in how they think about higher risk populations and, and, and groups that need more consideration, as well as just being better at talking to people and writing information and communication. So I think it's very transferable in terms of like health and, and health care. One of the big things that I am interested in is giving my students some language about um, research and open access. So I'm not sure if that's like necess or necessarily like super transferable to like their careers. But again, students, because I teach freshmen and, you know, this is like their freshman like research class, that sort of thing, like giving them some language as to why they hit paywalls, um, you know, who who's benefiting from those paywalls. Um, what is open, what is closed, that sort of stuff. I think that that is really transferable um, to their other learning situations and learning context. And maybe, maybe that will encourage them to encourage their instructors to adopt more open access <laughs> materials, perhaps. Um, so again, I, I think it is just um, open access for students and for them to learn this sort of language. I would also say um, I encourage them to uh, not use academies. And so they're writing for a general uh, educated audience, but not academics. And that's not something they're trained to do in all of their courses. They pick up academies and other art history classes. And I really discourage it because they're never going to use it again unless they go to grad school. So. Um, Writing for varied audiences, I think, is an important takeaway. Thank you all. We're getting really close to the time here. It's 2.28. Um, Shelly made a great comment in the chat uh, regarding career readiness. Open pedagogy gives, the chat's jumping, open pedagogy gives them material to include in resumes, to reference in job interviews, etc. I also have them annotate my syllabus and note which career readiness skills they will learn through our course activities and assignments. Um, so I'm going to have to stop the recording here and we'll start for the next session. I do apologize. It seems like we kind of ran out of time, but we can put a channel on Discord and we can, can you continue discussion there. I just want to say thank you to everybody who presented today and share their expertise and their tips with us. Thanks again.